Well, we just saw uh, the first, we think, the very first uh, shot of the uh, Pfizer vaccine in New York, coronavirus, right? uh, we think possibly in the country. Oh, I think so. I She's a registered nurse, there. obviously. Yeah. You can see there. And I see cameras clicking it's all over the, the first place. one in New York for sure. Yeah. Out there in Queens, Long Island, uh, Jewish, she Northwell. She stayed so calm. She did. I mean, I get the flu shot and I'm like, no, 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 I can't look, I can't look. There you have it. I just heard it. her say it didn't hurt. So it's there you happening. go. Trust us, you'll be hearing a lot more from this woman in the hours ahead. Wow, that's pretty cool. Go. We're seeing record high cases, deaths, and hospitalizations in the U.S. right now, and those numbers are climbing. How bad do you expect things to get over the next three or four months before the vaccine uh, is widely available? Well, sadly, the next uh, four to six months could be the worst of the epidemic. Uh, the IHME forecast shows uh, over 200,000 additional deaths. If we would uh, follow the rules in terms of wearing masks and not uh, mixing, uh, we could avoid a large percentage of those deaths. So in the near term, it's, it's bad news. You've been sounding the alarm on the threat posed by infectious diseases and pandemics for years. Even in your wildest dreams, did you think it would ever get this bad in the United States? No, I thought the United States would do a better job handling it. Uh, overall, when I did the forecast in 2015, I talked about uh, the deaths potentially being higher. So this virus could be more fatal uh, than it is. We didn't get the worst case. But the thing that's uh, uh, surprised me is that the economic impact in the U.S. and around the world has been much greater than uh, the forecast that I made five years ago. Your foundation just announced a new $250 million pledge to help fight COVID. That's in addition to the more than $1 billion you've already committed. Um, why did you do this? And, and specifically, where's the money going to go? We saw a unique role for us. Uh, we've been funding a lot of the research for the vaccines. We're very agile. Uh, you know, we're a partner in a thing called CEPI, which is the second biggest funder after uh, the U.S. government. So in diagnostic therapy and vaccines, we know where the science is. We know how the pieces need to come together uh, in an urgent way. And so our expertise in infectious disease, which normally only relates to developing countries, applied to the entire world for this crisis. These um, joined with former Presidents Obama and Bush and Clinton suggesting uh, that they would all take the vaccine publicly. Uh, are you considering doing the same? No, I'll do the same. When it's my turn, I'm not going to budge. But if, when my turn comes up, I will uh, visibly take the vaccine uh, because I, I think that uh, it's a benefit to all, all people to not be transmitting. Are you at all concerned about the wealthy and well-connected being able to get uh, access to a vaccine uh, b uh, before it's their turn, before most other Americans? You know, it should be based on medical need, uh, not wealth at all. After all, this epidemic has been awful in the way that it's exacerbated inequities. It's been worse for Hispanics, worse for Blacks, worse for uh, low-income service workers, uh, multi-generational households, a, a number of things that mean that in terms of picking who gets the vaccine, we better be using equity to drive all those decisions. More than 30 million people in California are right now under brand new stay at home orders uh, as hospitals there uh, risk being overwhelmed. Um, there are a lot of governors uh, who oppose bringing back these lockdown orders and forcing businesses cl to close. What do you think? Do you think more states need to consider taking that kind of drastic action and the kind of drastic action we saw when the pandemic first began? Or can there be a more nuanced approach? Well, certainly mask wearing uh, has essentially no downside. They're not expensive. Bars and restaurants in most of the country will be closed as we go into this wave. And I think, sadly, that's appropriate. Depending on how severe it is, the decision about schools is much more complicated because there, you know, the benefits are pretty high. The amount of transmission is not the same as in restaurants and bars. So, uh, you know, trade-offs will have to be made. But this, the next four to six months, uh, really call on us uh, to to do our best because we can see that this will end, and you don't want, you know, somebody you love to be the last to die of coronavirus. When do you think 
life will fully return to what we thought of as normal back in January. No masks, no social distancing, uh, no other protective measures necessary. Certainly by the summer, we'll be way closer to normal than we are now. But even through early 2022, unless we help other countries get rid of this disease and we get high vaccination rates in our country, the risk of reintroduction will be there. And of course, the global economy will be uh, slowed down, which hurts America economically in a pretty dramatic way. So we'll have, starting in the summer, about nine months where a few things like big public gatherings uh, will still be restricted. But you know, we can see now that somewhere between 12 to 18 months, and we have a chance, if we manage it well, uh, to get back to normal. Lessons can be learned from the UK, too, where thousands of people have already received the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Some people have had mild short-term side effects, like pain at the injection site and fatigue, which are not uncommon with vaccines. Two people in the UK, both of them healthcare workers with histories of severe allergic reactions, did have an adverse reaction. They have both recovered, but UK regulators are advising people who have a history of severe allergies not to get the Pfizer-BioNTech shot. Canada is not going quite that far. Crystal Gamansing reports. That's it, we're all done. Day two of the rollout, and now fewer Britons may be able to get the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. In what's being called a precautionary move, anyone with a significant allergy to food, medicine, or vaccines and carries an EpiPen shouldn't get the shot. Inevitably, you accrue more information over time. The information in this case follows two National Health Service workers having adverse reactions. Both have a history of serious allergies. We know from the uh, very extensive clinical trials that this wasn't a feature, but if we need to strengthen our advice now that we've had this experience in the vulnerable populations, the groups who've been selected as a priority, we get that advice to the field immediately. Regulators also say the vaccine should only be given where resuscitation is available. Right now, hospitals are being used as vaccination sites, but it could limit more locations being added. Canadians will not see the same limitations. Instead, a breakdown of ingredients is being published on the government's website, and people are encouraged to review it. Dr. Mark Greenwald calls okay. the changes in Britain it's ridiculous. ridiculous. And that is not to protect the public. That's to protect the individual's position, the, 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 the authority's position to look good. Australia has dropped development of a local vaccine candidate after trial participants came back with a false positive test results for HIV. It says it won't rush approval of vaccines because it wants people to have full confidence in immunization. A deal to purchase 51 million doses of this vaccine abruptly scrapped. The vaccine, developed by the University of Queensland and biotech company CSL, was still in early stages of testing when developers found it could interfere with HIV diagnosis. I think today and the decision we've taken should give Australians great assurance that we are proceeding carefully, we are moving swiftly, but not with uh, any undue haste here. At the end of the day, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, like with any vaccine in Australia, it must have their tick off. Without, without the tick, there's no jab when it comes to uh, vaccines in this country. The government has clarified that the vaccine was not scrapped because it's ineffective against COVID-19. It also didn't produce any serious adverse effects in trial participants. But they are concerned that if it's rolled out, it could trigger a wave of false positive HIV tests. We knew that we didn't want to have any issues with confidence and this false positive test may have caused some confusion and lack of confidence, but it was a very, very good technology. It was looking like it was going to make antibodies and it probably would have worked very well as a vaccine, but we can't have uh, any issues with confidence. The government has increased orders of rival jabs from AstraZeneca and Novavax. Australia also has an agreement with Pfizer, whose vaccine is expected to be approved by January. Australia expects to start vaccination next March and to have its whole population inoculated by the end of the year.